wait. <laughs> oh, we got we got Mike down with the count. We didn't even start it, and already he already, he already cracked. <laughs> That's a new record, by the way. Shortest time to crack me up in the podcast. <laughs> I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello and welcome to Cinema Royale, where there is no Royale whatsoever, and this name has been stolen. Mm. <sighs> Someone should sue. Thank God the original owners of this name did not sue me yet. <laughs> or if they do they watch the show maybe we're too maybe we were too entertaining for them to get angry possibly anyways I'm your host Mike Mixtape along with me are my awesome film officiados of the night here we go we got James Sullivan also known as Hami Tude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by the state of Wisconsin's Fluffy Cows. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my Fl- god. State of Wisconsin's Fluffy I cows. cows. I need to see this for myself. You gotta find that. <laughs> Give them the picture. Give them the picture. Mm-hmm. Just wait, Matt. He's got a picture. He'll show it to you. Okay. I gotta see some of them fluffy cows. You'd like to see a nice fluff dried cow? Yes. I wanna see a fluffy cow. Check there you go. Check <laughs> Oh my god. I know, right? <laughs> he has the exact same coat as my dog. What the fridge is this? That's what the state fu- state fair life is. Pampered. <laughs> All washed up, ready for the show. I know. I Ooh. want to. Uh, I want to give him a big hug. <laughs> Actually, so that's... Fluffy, I'm gonna die. <laughs> that's a quote I used. <laughs> so fluffy, I'm gonna die. And that's actually something else that Mike pointed out was that it has no udder, so it's technically a, it's a fluffy bowl. bowl. The bowl. Yes. It's Did it get neutered or? No, it's it's a bull. Yeah, it's, but still, you, you can't see it. I don't know. <laughs> what you? Like, wait, is that is, like, it, is that, that fluffy? It's trying to see like where's this bull? At? <laughs> is it that fluffy? I guess so. I have never seen that cow in person. So somewhere in <laughs> somewhere in Wisconsin, somebody's got that cow. You would brag about it for a freaking week if you met a fluffy cow. I would. I would even take a picture with it and use it as a profile picture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I want to. I want to buy one and add into my fluffy collection here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have him stuffed and added to my collection. <laughs> He's all, he looks already stuffed. Wait. <laughs> oh, we got we got Mike down with the count. We didn't even start it and already he already, he already cracked. <laughs> That's a new record, by the way. Shortest time to crack me up in the podcast. <laughs> And last but not least, let's forget, not forget, our favorite Canadian, Matt Brunelos, and those Anna Matt. Hey guys, I just came back from vacation, well, a little weekend vacation, so I'm fully energized, I got my juice back, so I'm ready to pot A. Pop it out. Mm-hmm. Turn down for what? <laughs> uh, so this episode, as you heard by the time you hear this, you hear the other episode, and we are going to talk about films, our favorite films, from our birth year. And this episode is actually dedicated to James Sullivan, who's going to turn 30 pretty soon. Yay! So, yay! Ah. Celebratory 30th birthday episode! 
I'm already enjoying my presents. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yay. Come with me and you'll be. So, okay. So in the comments below, if, so in the comments below, say happy birthday, James. Early happy birthday. <laughs> Give the birthday messages. So we are going to start from the oldest, which is James, and work our way down the line to the youngest. Yay, I'm last, so I can think of things that I can say. So, let's get this ball rolling with James and his first film from 1984. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, uh, it didn't really take much uh, to think what my favorite film is going to be. Oh, but, and by the way, um, we, get, uh, we get two films... Yes. Yeah, yeah. Run around. yeah, we have okay. time. Yeah, we'll have time for two. Don't worry about it. Yep, two. Okay. Uh, my favorite film was released in the summertime, actually, I uh, believe around, uh, which is ironically, you know, also when I was born in the summertime. Uh, this was a, this was uh, a certain film known as Ghostbusters. Wouldn't you want to say that when Morgan when Morgan's here? Mm. <laughs> the best laid schemes of mice and men. You know, like I'm sure he he wants to put his two cents on it. So maybe we'll save that for when he comes. <laughs> you want? Come on, because really, oh, you talked about that movie already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you know what? You're right. Uh, let's. We'll yeah. start with my second favorite and work up to my first. Okay. Second favorite. Um, second favorite film. I'm going to say it was a certain James Cameron movie that really got his career going. Oh. 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 Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah, well, obviously... It's it's yes. obviously. <laughs> yeah, there's a storm coming. And uh, when I first when I first saw this movie, oh, by the way, if you guys don't get the reference, uh, you're listening to this. It's the Terminator, duh. <laughs> and uh, when I first saw this movie, I I actually broke a few rules in my household. You see. When, uh, in my house, we, uh, growing up especially, we always, we always abided to the rating system. Well, here's a movie that comes along that's rated R. And, um, by the, and for the record, by the time I got around 10, uh, PG-13 movies, we gave them some leeway, because, you know, really... I could take something like the mask, uh, but um, oh, okay. Uh, here's a movie that's rated R, and I end up uh, I end up uh, watching the made-for-TV version, which is how I got around it. And it's actually still it's actually still pretty good, but uh, even for made-for-TV, and then. Then, uh, I never got busted. I got away with it. So then, watching it years later in college, I really sort of grew to appreciate it. But I notice, actually, what makes it creepy. Or part of what makes it creepy. And it, it's not just the whole very, what, what's actually a very typical technophobic uh, storyline. Uh, story but also the way in which it is executed. Uh, James Cameron, whatever or wherever he's, wherever he's directing something, even if it's a, a piece of crap story, at least it's going to look amazing. Uh, case in point, Mike and I just recently watched Piranha 2, <laughs> which was his directorial debut film. And the best we can say about it is, actually, it, it looked really nice. 
It looks good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, aside from looking really nice, um, uh, the the visual effects from that that time actually give give the film a sort of edge. Uh, you know, they're using uh, they were they were using all physical effects uh, mainly for the uh, mainly for the exo for the skeleton of the of the Terminator. They're using stop motion, and it actually makes it look creepier than say years later mm-hmm. when we had Terminator Two and even even uh, Terminator Three and God forbid Terminator Four. Uh, which um, it oh yeah all the CG are in which everything mm-hmm, in which everything looks too smooth too perfect and therefore it 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 kind of glosses over what made what gave the original its charm and uh, so you can look back on that and. With the, with the first Terminator, and say, yeah, this is this was a really good work, really good usage of puppetry here. Um, as for as for a lot of the rest of it, um, I'm also intrigued to to find out and realize that there were there were actually. Uh, a lot of cases brought up against it, and like? uh, well, if you watch the credits of the film, uh, you'll notice uh, a, a dedication uh, to uh, Mr. Harlan Ed- Ellison. Uh, uh, Harlan Ellison did not have anything per se, to do with the story, except um, it's very well documented that James Cameron, when coming up with the Terminator, basically, quote-unquote, knocked off a bunch of old sci-fi stories. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually... I've I've got it on my mental back burner to hunt some of these stories down one day and, and give them a... A read just to just to compare them, but the problem with that idea is the problem. The one thing that's holding me back from doing that is um, I would probably also have to watch an Outer Limits episode that was made based on one of these stories. And uh, goodness, I I I never really liked the Outer Limits, so. Mm-hmm. That's that's gonna be odd for me. I like the Twilight Zone, but not the Outer Limits. So mm, crap happens. Mhm. So yeah, Terminator uh, comes in. It kicks off Arnold's career for the '80s. Um. And uh, it. It is still a, a film that really holds up, in my opinion. Yeah, it totally mm-hmm. does. After 30 years, it still mm-hmm. holds up. So still got that charm of the mm-hmm. classic 80s flair. Yeah, you know, you know, James, I just want to add that you really did hit that mark with the creepiness level. Because I, I know exactly how... The Terminator is, it has that element of kind of like horror, or not horror, but more of a thriller in a way. Yeah, thriller. It's the notion of being, ch- it's like when your enemy is practically undefeatable. Like you wouldn't know how to kill it off. Because like he's this ma- like this big, this huge cyborg from the future that's just aimed to kill and is after you. You know that's that's pretty frightening. Yes. Plus the fact that it's like he'll do anything to to stop you. So mm. it 
pretty much adds in that fear that what's trying to kill you is something that you cannot defeat or you cannot s defeat or stop it. You can only try to escape. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Our eggs are Ding. are the eggs done? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> it's no, my brownies, yeah. thank you. <laughs> So yeah, that's a, that's what I would like to add about Terminator. It's definitely an, an awesome, awesome action flick, even with the with the stop motion. I know that that James Cameron is a huge fan of uh, Ray Harryhausen, so it really does add in to the factor. And with the stop motion, it really does look like a machine. It really does help make it like to have that non-human feel to it so it really adds that extra layer that not even computer can do yeah see everything's too perfect now you couldn't no. you couldn't make the terminator now like you did then no yeah yeah admittedly they, yeah yeah admittedly they did a, a few things better a, a few of the elements better with some of the ongoing sequels some of the some of the effects were uh, were a little bit more polished up, but it just doesn't have that that umph to it. Yeah, I still yeah. enjoy Terminator Three. I just wasn't uh, I, I just it, wasn't uh, frightened by it. I just didn't like find what, myself being like, okay. It, it's how like can you what be Bill... frightened by it. It's too hot this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sorry, what it's were you just saying? too bland. It, well, she's just too bland. I don't know. We've seen better. Uh, anyways, Terminator. but it's like it's like what um, animator Bill Plimpton says is we all miss those perfect imperfections. Pretty much, often it looks too. Per There's no errors. It's suddenly boring, you know. So you want to have those little like imperfections to really, to oddly enough, add into it. I actually read something interesting. There is a there is a an, a club. There is a, a sci-fi actors club that only two people, uh, two actors belong to. Um, the uh, the actors that have been killed on screen uh, or played characters on screen that have been killed by an alien. A predator and a terminator. There's only two actors who have this uh, prestigious have this honor. Title, this prestigious honor of being killed by these three <laughs> iconic monsters. Wow. Alien being specifically the alien from Alien. Yes. Uh, one actor, one such actor is Bill Paxton. Okay. And hmm. the other such actor is, I believe, Lance, Lance Henriksen, a.k.a. Bishop. Oh, okay. Sounds familiar. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if they have, if they have, like, group meetings for this, for this club or... <laughs> Can you imagine the, the undead sci-fi club? <laughs> the undead sci-fi club, exactly. So I can uh, imagine, I can imagine one of the two just watching like that their movies again. It was like, yeah, you see that? You see that? That thing killed me. <laughs> yep, that's that's how to die right there, you know. That's that's how to die like <laughs> they, a real man. They don't do that anymore these days in films. Yeah. Yeah, Lance Henriksen, uh, I, I believe, uh, finally attained the honor of being killed off by a predator and thus uh, joining this club when they made Alien vs. Predator. Oh, right, 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 oh. right, 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 right. Oh. Right. And with Bill Paxton, it was... Uh, a culmination of the previous films. He was in, the, I bl yeah, he was in the first Alien. Uh, he was in the first. He was in the first Terminator. And which, which Predator was he in? Actually, I I kind of forget. Predators, Predator, Predator Two. 
It's either because I don't think it was in Predator. It was probably not pr- Predator Two. Couldn't be Predators. It's got to be one of the Aliens versus Predators. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know. Somebody in the comments below tells. Mm-hmm. So, uh, while I wait for somebody else to come on and fellow splay with uh, with my other pick from 1984. Cash bastards! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, just for, before I go on, 84 is a excellent year for films, my dude. Mm-hmm. Just I from mean, the two that you mentioned. Just like, the two from dude. James mentioned. Those are the most popular ones from the 84, but other... Otherwise, there are plenty other films from 84 you are worth checking out. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, Karate Kid, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Eh, that's okay. Nightmare on Elm Street. Hell, yeah. Dude. Gremlins. Star what? Trek Three. Yeah. Dude. I was born in a good year. It was a great year for 84, and James was... It was a very good year. We so, got Ghostbusters, Reagan. and then we got Terminator. <laughs> so, um, I was born in 89, in December of 89, the tail end of the 80s. And, uh, <laughs> of course, 1989 had great films such as the sequels to Back to the Future and Ghostbusters, uh, Ghostbusters 2 and Back to the Future Part 2. There was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure... There was Batman with uh, Tim Burton directing and right Michael mm-hmm. Keaton. Let's not check. What, what oh no! <laughs> I thought Roger Rabbit was released during no, that time. It was '88 actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I know I know um, Little Mermaid was released in '89. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I was gonna mention that too, and uh. And all dogs go to heaven at the same time. Yep. Yep. That one too. Yep. So. Well. All Dogs wasn't a hit, per se, but it was... No. A well, that was video. because of The Little Mermaid. Yeah, The Little oh, Mermaid's yeah. competition. So... Uh, when Harry got... Met Sally... Uh, yeah, that was a great thing. Yeah, Honey, was... I Shrunk the Kids. There's, there was plenty of films for my year. They were really good, too. But I wanted to step out of the box and test my uh, <laughs> uh, film knowledge. Uh, I went outside of the America Cinema. Outside of it. So all the films we just mentioned are American films. Uh-huh. I went to New Zealand for my film choice. Hmm. Um, oddly enough, I just looked up the day before doing this episode. This movie came out on my birthday, December 8th, 1989. So it's my birthday film. Yeah. It's my birthday film. And I did not know this. <laughs> well, somebody give the man a fluffy cow. What was it? <laughs> so... <laughs> You might know the director of this such film. This is way before his most popular work later on in his career. This is his early career. And you may know the name of Peter Jackson. Oh. I know what film this is. Meet the Feebles. Meet the Feebles. We're not your average, ordinary people. Yes. Meet the Feebles. If you like the Muppets, it's got the Jim Henson style puppets. It's a puppet film, musical, and God, what other genre would you put it in? It's a uh, brunch comedy. Yes, black. Co- it's, it's actually called a black comedy, actually. So, where do Even I start? There's no black actors in it. Do do do. Um, but where do I start with Meet the Feebles? Oh my god, I I sat down and sort of like watched it from tail from start to beginning, uh, and it blew my mind from each second. Um, the puppets are great. There was a few of them that were like full body costumes, and then, but basically the story is, it's Meet the Feebles. It's it's a like a variety show type of thing that. Um, is live. I mean, just imagine meet, uh, meet. Oh, it's the Muppet the show. show. It's the Muppet Show. Just imagine. Essentially. The, just think of the Muppet Show combined with uh, something. It's like 
really, really dirty, raunchy, like you see, you see boobs, you see, you hear swearing. It's it's like a rated R Muppet Show. It's a it it's a cross a between Park, Muppet Show South and Park Fritz the Muppet Cat. Show? Oh, that bad. Oh, oh, yes. Well, for me, I wouldn't say it's bad. It just blew my mind because basically, the story is there's a couple of subplots in there they mix in, but the main story is that it's it the Beat the Feeble show has his main star who is a hippo, and. He, she got discovered by this main guy who's a walrus, and he's in a love affair with a cat. And within the first five minutes, you see him screwing with the cat. You see a full-on sex scene with the cat and the walrus, which I don't understand how that works. Ugh. Um, so there's there, there's like a crackling relationship between the hippo and the walrus, and they trying to. But it, but the war is... I, I don't remember the character's name, for fuck's sake, so don't quote me on the character's names. The walrus and the carpenter were walking hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> I just know the animals, all right? Because they're, they're puppets, all right? They're fucking puppets, all right? So they're animals. So it's, so it's, quite it's, literally it's, fucking puppets. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> so, um... So this hip, hippo's a big fatty, and she likes to eat when she's depressed, and she's not supposed to eat. It's in her contract, and, you know, she's performing her song. She breaks the set, and blah, blah, blah. And you got subplots like this new uh, guy coming in, falls in love with... a hedgehog. Hedge, a hedgehog. He falls in love with this dog, and there's a little love story with that one. And there's another subplot where there's a, a rat who, uh... uh does like a side uh, business with the walrus does like porn so there's like a cow porn being made and they're trying to and then another sub another subplot is the walrus is it a fluffy cow porn <laughs> there's another subplot Debbie where... <laughs> are you screwing cows again <laughs> no that would be Betsy ooh Another subplot is the walrus and a couple of his buddies uh, sell cocaine on the side, and it's just all over the place. And eventually, uh, oh, because the the love story between the walrus and the hippopotamus is breaking apart. The walrus does not want to be with the hippo anymore. He wants to be with the cat, and uh, eventually, this hippo wants to commit suicide. She tries to commit suicide. It's very sad, tragic. All of a sudden, there's this, there's a point where she's got the gun in her mouth and she's ready to shoot the, the cat, who was in love affair with the walrus, comes right in and she's like, oh, don't mind me. Just shoot yourself. I don't care. Something clicks in the hippo's mind. Just goes mental. Grabs the gun. Starts shooting up everyone. Spoilers. That's this is the ending. He, he She shoots up everybody. Everybody, everybody in the this, meet, meet the Feeble show. She, it's a massacre. And, you, and then these are real bullets, mind you, real bullets. Because uh, part of the trivia is they couldn't find blanks, so they use real ammo in the scene. So when you see the gun going up, it's real ammo. So they're shooting puppets. What? Yes, <laughs> that's a little trivia. Peter Jackson is a maniac. It's oh a, my god. There's your trivia for you. Use real bullets. So they're like, duh, 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 duh. killing, killing, killing. And only a few survivors, uh, um, well, the two, uh, couple, the couple of the hedgehog and the dog live at the end, kind of say, uh, yep. Then you got the walrus, he's dead. There's a, there's a fox character who sings about abortion in the show, and he survives at the end. I thought, I thought it was sodomy. That's what it was, sodomy, sorry. There was something like that, sodomy. It, it's just a weird and it's so outrageous. Wick, 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 sour, wick, sour, shower. All right. Oh, man. I don't know if it's, it's, it's definitely, I don't know. I kind of like 
I don't know. Do I call him my new favorite? Because it just blew my mind. It's like, really? This is the film that Peter Jackson made before all his fame? And he... It's it. it yeah, the... It's a movie where you got to see the belief. You, you have to see the film to believe it. You just have to go in there either blind without my knowledge or just with this knowledge just go into it. Like, think about the, the director and then think about, you know... Oh my god. It just Yeah, I have to um I I I have to respond with a uh with with my feelings on this film because I actually have I have seen it. Um yeah, Peter Jackson before he was known for stuff like Lord of the Rings or even if you want to go hardcore, The Frighteners. Um he was Really early on in his career, he was directing movies like this one, which were pretty much straight-up B-movies or or even C-D movies. But there were uh, – some of the other examples would be Bad Taste and Dead Alive, which are actually my two, my two favorites of his early years. Oh, uh, dead, oh dead Alive. Jesus. Dead Alive. Yes, the zombie, the zombie film with the, uh, uh, with a lawnmower scene. But um, meet the feeble, meet the feebles. For some reason, I, the other two films I liked. There was something about this that was just not, not up to snuff. And I'm, I'm trying my, my darned us to be to be nice to this movie because it's your favorite mike from this from this year so i will say this you there's one subplot that you forgot about did i because there's there, there, there mind you there's so many subplots in this you can't i couldn't even follow them and the ones i mentioned is the ones i remember okay i'm talking about the subplot with the with the uh sexed up rabbit oh that's right! Oh my god, I can't believe I forgot about that one. Yes, there's a sub. I like this. I there's... like this. Oh my god. <sighs> I like this part because, particularly because of the, of the payoff that this subplot, this subplot has, the the build up and everything. He, he, this character gets the news early on. He's uh, he's a total playboy. You know he's he's sleeping around, partying, partying, and his gig on the show is that he's the he's the announcer in the beginning. You know he's uh, he pops out of a rocket and goes hey or something like that. Yeah. It, I want to say hey kids, but that's no, that was wrong show. You're wrong. Yep. <laughs> but he's he's doing a fake laugh or something. Yeah, yeah it's the Meet the deal, meet the feebles or whatever, and uh, he gets the news that he's he's got AIDS. Oh, from and he starts, and he starts he starts feeling bad like early on in the film, and as the film progresses, uh, he has the most. He has the most interesting character development. You know, he's a guy who's realizing that he's he's pretty terminal, or he might be very terminal, and he's just getting sicker and sicker as the film goes on. But total change. He's it's one of those total change in attitude moments where you're kind of like, okay, he's not going to be sleeping around anymore. But he's he's like blowing pus out of every. Out of every orifice, yep. and then when the show goes up that night, uh, he's popping out of his rocket, and he's like, <laughs> throws the ball over the audience, and then the rocket blasts off to start up the show, and I'm watching this like. After everything else that I said through, this is hilarious. <laughs> this is hilarious. Seriously. But then, 
Yeah. But then the payoff comes to the, the payoff to his story comes out. He's he's backstage in his room. He's praying to God. He says, he says, please, if there's a miracle out there, let me li- please let me live or something to that degree. And suddenly, he gets a phone call from the doctor. And the doctor says, actually, it turns out you didn't have AIDS after all. It's just, uh, you just have, a uh, you just have a flu. <laughs> what? And so, <laughs> and so, with this knowledge, he is overjoyed, and he's running out into the hallways going, hey, yes, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live! And then all of a sudden, bam... He gets his head blown off by the <laughs> hippo with the machine gun. Yep. Oh my god. <laughs> oh man, this is. Oh man, it's it's, yeah, it's it's one of those films you have to. You have to keep an open mind on. You can't be like, just, just, just like embrace, just absorb it all. Just like don't expect anything. No, don't, because it's just a, it's like a puppet snuff film. <laughs> Basically, this film is not holy. I will tell you that. No, it's 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 gonna make you. Uh... Mm-hmm. Yeah. The way to talk about it, enjoyment of it is to spoil it. So unfortunately, we did. We had to. But if you mm-hmm. felt like you want to go check it out, go ahead. Okay. So, I guess Morgan ain't here. So I guess it's my turn now. We'll skip them, and you go ahead. All right. So, anyways, I was born in 1992, late 1992, actually, um, October 5th, to be precise. Now, this was during the time in animation when Disney was at the height of their popularity. They were already big with films like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, um, re- technically there was also Rescuers Down Under, but that didn't really do anything. But yeah, with those two films, they were pretty much at the height. And The Lion King wasn't even out yet, so they were still climbing. They were pre- they pretty much put animation back on the map, and they put themselves back on the map. Back to when it, it was like the good old days of Walt Disney. So it was pretty much considered the Disney Renaissance. But to my point, in 1992, they continued rising up to their popularity with Aladdin. Yay! So, now, I have seen, I've seen Aladdin a few times before, and I will say, yes, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a great uh, Disney film. There's a lot of great points. However, I will say, I'm not... It, it's a great film, but I wouldn't say it's the best in the Disney collection. There are a few things, however... That I, it's like I didn't really care much. For me, like it's just it's a really simple story. This is just boy meets girl. That's what it essentially is. It's Aladdin who falls in love with Jasmine. That's pretty much it. Um, but and other but anyways, other than that, what really really sells it for me are two things. Number one, the music, the and the songs by. Alan Menken, Howard Ashman, and Tim Rice. These are amazingly good songs. They're really catchy and they're really memorable. Friend, you know, there's a lot of great ones. Friend Like Me, you know, f- like possibly one of the greatest uh, comedic side- like sidekick songs. There's A Whole New World, a very popular romantic Disney song. Uh, what else is there? Prince Ali. That's a fun. It's a fun one. You know, they practically all the songs. They have this really fun. It's it's all fun. You know, like this is pretty much like this kind of feel good uh, movie. Oh, hey Morgan. Uh, hey, for the uh, for those of us uh, for those of you just joining us, we are discussing uh, the film Aladdin from 1992. Yeah. Um, another thing, what can I meant? Another thing. Oh yeah, number two. I guess I could go on to the second reason why it's so good. They have some of the greatest Disney side characters, like the sidekicks. Um, they, I find that 
they're even more memorable than the character than like the main characters. Like yeah, they're like Aladdin, Jasmine, Jafar. They're good characters, but they don't they don't even hold a candle compared to the genie, which is pretty much this is pretty much Robin Williams at his finest. This is what really defined um, Robin Williams as like himself, his comedy shtick. This is like the best of the best. This is what really made it work. Like. Even the pop culture references, like, they somehow made it work. Um, Iago by Gilbert, uh, it's pretty Gilbert much... Gilbert Godfrey. Yeah, it's Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> he, sound, like, he sounds like a, a loud parrot, so why not make him a loud parrot? It just fits very <laughs> well. And this is why nowadays people practically associate his voice with Aladdin. Plus the fact that Gilbert Godfrey... Whenever he gets the chance to be Iago, he takes it. Like, he often appears in, like, I think video games. I know he's appeared in, in t- on TV shows and all that kind of stuff. So, And also there's Abu, because it's Abu. So, I mean, who doesn't mm-hmm. love, wait, a, little mo- wait, who doesn't wait, love wait. a little monkey? Did you say there was a boob in Aladdin? A b- <laughs> no, a boob. I, I, I don't remember that little message. <laughs> Well, technically, there's two with Jasmine, but that's another story. <laughs> oh boy, uh, is it is it is it good teenagers take their clothes off? <laughs> oh, don't even. Oh, you you oh, do not want to test me with that myth with that myth, Morgan. <laughs> I know he's on. saying. I know it's he's good. saying. Come on, Tiger, go no, run good, off. No, it's like good kitty, take off and go. Yes, I have gotten into arguments with other, with uh, college students about this. I shit you not. James? No surprised. Did they cut off your ear and did not like your pretty face? <laughs> exactly. So hey, they changed but... that lyric to the... Hey, what can you say? And the heat is immense. Hey, what can he say? Hey, what can he say? It's home. <laughs> hey, it's home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, you know, Morgan, you actually brought up a really good point. Um, Aladdin, you know, from from a bit of my research, Aladdin is actually one of the most controversial Disney films they have ever made. Not just, I know. but mostly because of the ster- um, of the st- of um, pretty much stereotyping the pretty of like Arabians and stuff like that. Not just that, but there's also um, the skin tone. Where they made Aladdin a more light skinned one, a light skinned Arab, and then you got Jafar, which is completely dark skinned. Yeah, and mustache. Like there, so there was that like little theory of like uh, white supremacy or stuff like that. This is some. This is a problem they they obviously fix in the Princess mm-hmm. and the Frog. Like they made sure of that. And also, there's two other controversies behind it too: the thief and the cobbler, less said the better, and the fact that Robin Williams had a bit of a stiff with Disney. He said, "I don't want to be not, hugely." It's not Disney. It's Katzenberg. <laughs> uh, yes. I shall get my slaves back to work. <laughs> they must make animals for me. They <laughs> shall do my bidding in every will. That's not do to make me Pocahontas. It'll be the biggest thing ever. What do you mean I'm fired? <laughs> Wait, what, do you mean I, what do you mean I can't? he wasn't fired no he wasn't fired he just wanted to be king and they said no so he left I'll show you mm-hmm. yes, I will make dream works yeah. oh. and the pride lands are never the same again trust me he's a madman like, he's a great guy but for fudge sakes he's a madman Mm. Have you seen his recent purchases? Have you seen DreamWorks TV on YouTube? He's letting that thing exist. He's insane. Not to mention Netflix. But back to Aladdin. Um, yeah. Uh, fun bits of trivia about about Robin Williams, uh, who I believe uh, I believe Morgan was about to mention. Uh, they say they say that in this. In this particular film, he's got about 52 different impressions altogether. And the one thing that surprises me about this is that 
Uh, DreamWorks movies, DreamWorks animated movies. Oh, here's the connection here. Uh, <laughs> they get they get clout. They get clout for uh, pop culture references all over the place. Aladdin sort of started that. Yeah, pretty and much. That, and made it work somehow. Even with uh, even with one at least one of the sequels, I think. Uh, Aladdin and the King of Thieves still, but only because they had Robin Williams back. No, um, but that was because like. They that was after Jeffrey Katzenberg left. I think there was a new, there was a new president, a, a Disney president. I think Joe Roth. He made a public apology to Robin Williams, and because of that, he decided to return at, in Aladdin, King of Thieves. Mm-hmm. Yep. I which which that. really made it work. Which made it work. Which is, mm. which is pretty much why Aladdin, King of Thieves is practically one of the best uh, directed DVD sequels. It's so good. This message is brought to you. <laughs> this message is brought to you by Sand. It's everywhere. Get used to it. You've interrupted the Aladdin and Jasmine Redding. Prepare to be vaporized. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or my favorite, Geronimo, Idaho, Arapaho, Pocahontas. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, they were. Uh, they were in su- in practical self-loathing mode with that film. They were just making fun of their own stuff left and right. Well, no, it's Robin Williams. No, the thing is, they got Robin Williams. He's just doing his own thing. Mm-hmm. And it, and like in the first Aladdin, it works also in um, in uh, oh, what was it? yeah in King of Thieves. Like even in the opening, it was like like da-da! oh, some of you didn't believe. <laughs> it's so seriously if you don't if you if you got the chance you got to go check out the king of thieves it's a it's great animation is crap but still it's awesome the other thing i wanted to point out is uh oh boy here comes the guy who compares stuff to books uh who's familiar <laughs> with the who's familiar with the story of aladdin the Adidu? arabian night story very vaguely, to be honest. I will, I will tell you that uh, that there were actually uh, two genies. Two genies. Well, technically, mm-hmm. in the Disney film as well, at Jafar at the end. Yeah, but the uh, the genie that you see, uh, at least from my research, I I haven't actually read. The uh, I haven't actually read the story, but from my research, there are two genies with polar opposite attitudes, and the Robin Williams genie is a sort of a culmination of both. One's a a friendly genie of the ring, and the other is a sort of a the genie of the lamp is a sort of an asshole. Yeah, uh, here's a guy who's just got an. Uh, he's he's just got a particularly nasty attitude towards everybody that he works with, and um, uh, he he also gets to choose which which wishes he grants. So. Well. Yeah. Hmm. He's not interesting. Uh, so when uh, so when it comes time to. So when it comes time to um, being owned by Jafar, he's just kind of like, yeah, now I can have some fun. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Yeah, Aladdin is that one film that I grew up with during the 90s, and I love the shit out of it. I watched all the sequels, and I even watched the TV series when it came out. Yeah, I've watched a bit of the TV series as well, honestly. You know, and one thing I want to mention about Robin Williams and the pop culture references, funny enough, you know, when when everybody mentions about pop culture references in, in animated films like DreamWorks or stuff like that, often they they criticized it, they would criticize it to feel like it's dated. Somehow, Robin Williams pulls it off in a way that it makes, that it's, that, where Aladdin still feels timeless. Like, no matter when you watch it, it's still... 
you know, it's, it's still something that any generation can watch and enjoy and love. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's kind of you know it's a strange combination, but it works. Yeah, it does. It's, it's definitely it's definitely pop culture references done right. Mm-hmm. So with that, let's do a little recap for you listeners out there. Uh, James started with the Terminator. I talked about Meet the Feebles, and Matt did Aladdin. Let's hop back a couple of years to 1990 with Morgan Ledger. Oh, good God. I must say, first off, um, I'm going to break the mold just for a second here and break character a little. Um, actually, first off, I have an AC running. Is it too loud, or can you hear it? We can hear it, but it's not that loud. Don't no, worry about okay. it. Okay, good. Fine. Uh, all right. First off, a little shout-out to Matt, because I wanted to mention this at the beginning, but I didn't have enough time. Uh, I think your childhood's coming back, Matt. Dur? My child. <laughs> imagination, imagination. Oh, boy. A dream can be so how do you a like the comic? Well, from what I get... From what I can understand, the comics actually did have an origins tale on me, you know? The fact that I was this imagination from this tinker and stuff, and then I go into a whole other world, and in the second um, comic, I get teamed up with this ugly son of a bitch. Oh, yeah. What the fridge is, is that? that? That's the dog <laughs> from John Carter. They mixed in John Carter from this? I, I, don't, I don't know how. I don't know how. It's imagination. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> One little we have imagination! Yay! So, so let me just say. I'm for, surrounded by bad impressions. What's going on? For, um, I did not come in. Why did I come in at this point? <laughs> oh, too much smoking dwarves. Okay, uh, back to back to 1990. Right. Um, I have to bring up these films together because they're pretty crucial to this year. I'll try to be very brief with them. Um, but 1990, good God, there was a whole selection of films I could have gone with. Um, The Nutcracker, Prince, which, <laughs> pretty, pretty awful film. Um, you had a year which had Ghost by, um, one of the Zucker brothers. You had Home Alone, which is the top high seller. Uh, Dances with Wolves. And speaking of Terminator, Total Recall, um, and Kindergarten Cop. But I think the go for the mold and just say the two films that I think are personal. And just so you know, James, if you're thinking it, it's not going to be Nightbreed. Oh. oh, I know what it could be. This was a very, very important year, 1990, because one talented artist went out with a pretty good bang with two films, one that didn't do so well and one that actually did so well. They weren't directed, but they were somewhat slightly shepherded and somewhat slightly produced, and in light of one of these films getting a remake. Oh, right. Yes. Yes. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yes, Ninja. I had to... Ninja. Rap. Oh, no, that's oh, no, no. It, it's no, this no, one no. right here that you're looking for, James. That's the uh. rap, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't Pooey. Get... No, no, I it's thought... actually... No, it's a good sequel. It's a good sequel. It is. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm a little disappointed at um, you, Morgan. <laughs> I thought you were gonna go with. We can't do any worse than the Godfather Three. <laughs> I, I wanted to, but I didn't. You're gonna hate me when I say this because I didn't see the Godfather Part Three yet. That's actually I, I, kind of a good thing. <laughs> well, I, 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 I would if I could, but I was on a Twin Peaks kick this entire week, mm-hmm. um, so I'm going with what I know. But there are two films that are very important to 1990. One is The Turtles, and the other is The Witches, which was released one day before the day I was born, weirdly enough. So that kind of ties into the importance of the year. But I guess I should probably talk about The Turtles first. Um, This is very important to Jim's career because it actually launched the Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Well, before that came... The Dark Crystal, which employed the idea of doing a special effects company because it was really good at special effects and stuff. And the Turtles are one of his bigger clients. And the biggest question was, wait a minute, I am making a movie, sorry, I am making a movie or I'm supervising a film or supplying the puppets for a film that is sort of 
violent in a way. You have these characters using all sorts of ninja sort of devices, but um, he was assured that it was more stylized and more cartoony, and so they they went with it. Yes, there were parental concerns, but I've seen worse films. I've seen worse damaging films. There, there's actually a pretty nice message to this one if you don't look at it too, too well. You have, you know, the five turtles being together, you know, acting as brothers to each other and all that sort of stuff. Yes, there is Michelangelo, Donatello, Raphael, Leonardo. Four. Shit, there's four. Damn it. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking. I was like, it's, it's, it's like, why are you saying unless, five? Unless Venus, you're ca- unless you're counting Venus and next mutation, which shouldn't, she doesn't. I'm shouldn't sorry. Exist. She, or maybe she, they she look at Splinter like a brother. Oh yes. Fun fact: uh, Splinter was voiced by Kevin Clash. You might know better as Elmo. Yep. So really, Kevin did. So Elmo did do some good things before the furry red menace. Um... <laughs> That's his nickname. Anyway, um, the thing with the turtles is that they act like brothers. They're just together. They're family. They argue with one another. And that message comes full circle near the end when you have you know Shredder being like the anti yang and yang here, hiring kids on to do his evil bidding. You know, using the path of you know hate and crime to fuel the elegance of um, ninjutsu sort of system. So you have good versus evil in a way. And I think that's greatly summed up when you have Casey Jones coming in as the voice of reason, telling these kids, you know, is this what you want to be like? Is this sort of the thing you want to join here? You know, it's, it sort of ties itself together. Think to yourself, you know, when it comes to being together, doing these sort of things, you know, crimes and all that sort of stuff, that's really not the way to be. And mm-hmm. it, it's very, very subtly addressed, very, very um, well done, nicely stylized, too. Um, Steve Barron, who directed this film, who later did Rat and Coneheads, did a lot of music videos in his day, like Michael Jackson's Billie Genie, and his direction really shows, especially when you're in the sewers, and a lot of the fight scenes feel like a choreographed music video stunt show, as Gene Siskel noted in his extremely, extremely negative review, because he couldn't understand the appeal of the Turtles, and yet Ebert, to a degree, was a little more positive despite his two and a half star review <laughs> is it hey, out of hey, four or five four four okay so it's not that bad yeah, yeah, yeah trust me ebert was not that negative siskel was like hammering down on the turtles wow he was like legitimately hammering down on these guys the fact that they're pizza junket teenager stereotypes yes i know i know i know one of them I... sounds like cory feldman yeah. we need to bring Okay, we need to bring Gene Siskel back to life. All right, Gene, could you please review the new TMNT? <laughs> oh, Take a good look at it too. <laughs> he's gonna die is... again. He's gonna die yeah. again when he sees like, oh no no, it's just a mask. Yeah, <laughs> it's Shrek. <laughs> and these work so so well because this movie works so well because it treads two mediums it treads the comic source and the cartoon source so you could go either way with it you could say it's going from the cartoon but it's much darker and grittier or you could say it's going from the comic books but it's more lighthearted because of its you know <clears throat> kid friendly nature so you know i'd be fine showing this to them and even the ending you got to admit it with the villain getting taken down by the smallest simplest thing instead of a bloody bludgeon and violent fight scene um which i can understand the frustration people would probably want to see splinter go up against shredder in an all-out brawl but think about it this way if you really saw that rat take down shredder and bludgeon to the point where brains are on the pavement there would be no point in that fight uh-huh the fact that he uses wit instead of brawn is much more interesting and yet poetic manner. So in some weird way, it works as a Japanese artsy ninja film and also an oriented modern-day action film. Um, I'd say it's pretty well done. It's, again, very beautifully shot, very, very well done. The nitty-gritty New York City has sort of a very nice, light-hearted um, feel, even though it's sort of an obvious action sort of scene. There's a lot of nice dark shadows here. So it really comes across more to the comics and the cartoon, and that's where it works perfectly. Um, and I find that interesting considering the sequel, which came out roughly, I think, a year later, which is much lighter in tone. And this is weird. 
it starts off with a dedication to Jim Henson. Mm. And it's the first of two films to do that. The second was Muppet Christmas Carol. And being a Henson fan, I think it's more credible when Muppet Christmas Carol is dedicated to him than this one. Mm-hmm. And even though and even though Jim did sort of agree to the idea of a sequel because this one here made a hundred and thirty over a hundred and thirty million dollars domestically. And by the way, here's the budget for all of you little um financial mathematical kids out there. This movie was made for roughly between thirteen to fifteen million. I'm pretty sure it might have been 13 million. That's how small this was. This was an independent company that did this. It outgrossed Dirty Dancing by a long shot, and Dirty Dancing had its record by 60 million. This easily beat it. That's because in 1990 you couldn't touch the turtles. Nope, no one could touch the turtles until Team and T3. (laughs) (sighs) (laughs) Help, I'm a turtle, I can't get up. Were you expecting the Adams family? <laughs> but no. And this is the uh, point we should all go. I made a funny. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Elvis. Um, <laughs> but anyway, long story short, um, Jim did a pretty good job allowing these to advance the ideal of puppetry because you had you know these men in suits with very complicated stuff. When you see the turtles move, they actually move like you know actual living, breathing beings, and that makes these characters a little more engaging. Because they're not just sock puppets, they're actual moving full-fledged characters because of how the technology progressed over time. The the, the Waldo um, puppet, I think, they used where he had someone's um, hand in a different mechanism sort of controlling the head. And you see this in the documentary, so if it wasn't for that technical system, the advancement of technology and prosthetic effects wouldn't have really progressed, even in radio technology. Um, but no, the second film I want to bring up, other than Turtles, was The Witches. And this is the big one. This is the oh. huge, huge one. This is the one <laughs> where Rondal... Yes. Save it. Save it. Because <laughs> there was another... Because I, I, I can't talk about that film without connecting the two because they're both Henson Productions and they're so crucial, but I'll try to be short. <laughs> the Witches is pretty much about a boy that ends up in a hotel with his grandmother who's his, who's his, who's his parents have died and so she's trying to take, he's trying to take care of them. He is trying to take care of her, and apparently he stumbles across the secret society witches that have decided to kill all these boys by turning them into mice, which was the plot of the book. But apparently there were certain liberties that were made that completely made Rondal completely pissed off. But, so, on, but it's Rondal, so like, if you're going to make a movie, you're already getting into trouble. The only thing he agreed with is Angelica Houston as the Grand High Witch, because he loved Angelica Houston. Yeah. Henson, on the other hand, was busy with the Jim Henson Hour, and that led him to a lot of hot water because Rondal did not approve of Nicholas Riggs, the director. If I'm pronouncing his name right or wrong, I do apologize. It's Nicholas Rogue. something. Thank you, Rogue. Um, and the fact that Rondal, Dahl, I should probably call him by that, was unaware of the ending change, because if you haven't read the book, spoiler alert, the boy remains as a mouse, and the problem is mouses have a very short lifespan. But, of course, he was fine with it because when his grandmother goes out, so will he. In the movie, a good witch gets reformed and turns him back into human. Ooh. Giving us a super happy fun ending. Dahl was not pleased. He was angry. He actually planned, and I'm not kidding here, to berate the movie to the end of the earth. He said he would literally go into press conferences and dismiss the movie. He was going to hate it for the entirety of his life. Which wasn't too much longer after that. There was a good reason why. Henson was under pressure because he was the producer. He was trying to control as much as he could. He was also in work of the mice puppets and also the special effects with the witches. He thought the project was fine, but he was greatly, greatly upset with Dahl's words, even though he tried to control as much as he could the project, but it was a little ill-fated. 
And so he sent Dahl an apology letter, and I wish I had the quote up, but I don't. It's a very, very well-thought-out quote. But I'll try to remember from the best of my ability. He said in this letter that he deeply apologized to Dahl about the mishandling of the project, and he wished he got off of the start way, way better than earlier. He said that The Witches was a really good book, and he wished that things didn't lead up to this point. It was a very, very heartfelt letter. You can read this in the Brian J. Jones um, biography. Dahl, at the very least, forgave him for this, even though it was a little grudging me, but at least he appreciated this sincere apology, and thus he just let it go. Hmm. And I think... And it's interesting to see that these two films were the last of Henson's work. You had one which was pushing the boundary of um, special effect technicals, and yet you had another one which was literally adaptation. And as much as Jim, you know, could have directed if he wanted to, he had other projects in the way. So to the best of his ability, he tried to control that one as you know much as he could, even though he had a director he only could trust. But yet, when he really put into play... He sort of ended out with a little on a good note, even though The Witches didn't do well, but it did have good reviews. It, it was, like, really, really well-praised, even for a director that didn't have that many good movies to praise upon. So you had The Turtles for Kids, which was nice, lighthearted, and fun. You had The Witches, which was deeply full meaning, aside from that ending near the end. And then you had Rowan Atkinson. I will leave it at that. Trust me, if you want to see Mr. Bean running a hotel, this is the closest you'll get to seeing it. So uh, if you have the chance, uh, Turtles, Witches, I think it's a good double feature. Mm-hmm. I know I've got my Halloween uh, set up. Um, yep. With the... Yeah. Uh, uh, with the... Um, uh, the case of the Ninja Turtles, uh, for the record... Yeah, I still do have that uh, that VHS tape with both Roger Rabbit and Ninja Turtles on it. Uh, mm-hmm. But one thing I never I never tell people is that um, I uh, back in the day with that videotape, I used to almost always fast forward past Ninja Turtles to get to Roger Rabbit. Uh, the um... <laughs> Mike. Mike, you better slap harder. You better slap harder, Mike, because for a long time my childhood, I believed TMNT3 was the true Turtles film. It was the only one in my library. <laughs> With, let me, let me explain. Let me explain. I saw the other okay. two later. Sorry. Mike. Okay. <laughs> Mike, we got a mic down. We got a mic down. He <laughs> gave nice. himself too much go. pain. <laughs> Say it. Go. Go. Okay. Uh... According to, according to my my young mindset on this, um, the uh, what made the Ninja Turtles great was the cartoon, the video games, all that all that kid friendly stuff that they were doing at the time. Uh, with this film, I didn't really have anything against it. It just didn't, it just did not grab my interest. It was not. Uh, with uh, with the more serious tone that they that they took the franchise in uh, it didn't it didn't uh, uh, exactly bond with me very well uh, with uh, it was only in later viewings when I was much much older that I I would actually look back at these at these movies except except the third one and appreciate what it was they were what it was they were trying to do with this serious tone and i think that morgan is right on point when he says it is a near perfect combination of the serious tone that the original comic source had versus the more kid-friendly tone that I would already been used to. And believe me, I, if I had had my way, it would have been 100% the kid-friendly cartoon. Uh, but I still... I I enjoy the movie now looking back on it. Mm. Then there's an alternate ending I wish they kept on. Mm. This is the Ooh. one where they, they do uh, turn Shredder into spaghetti? 
Uh, no, it's actually a little more um, meta than that. It's in the comic adaptation, and it's also on a German DVD, albeit in English, surprisingly enough. Um, originally, it was going to end right after they Shao Kao Bungie. We saw April Neal go to a comic publishing place because you remember during the ranch scene, she's illustrating all the. Um, no, that's right. I know what you, I know what you're talking about. Oh my god, yes. All the kids, all the kids out there in Video Land don't know about this. Um, so, because you remember she does all the illustrations and stuff during the ranch scenes, and later she goes to the comic and publishing uh, place. The head looks at it and he goes, "This is a great idea for a series, but I don't think it's realistic." And then you see behind him in the window, he's not seeing it, but behind him in the window, all four turtles are in the frame listening into the meaning, and I think it's Raphael that falls out. He just literally falls, and he holds on to a ledge, and he's like, Really? Unrealistic? <laughs> oh my god, yes, I've seen it too. I've seen it, it's, I think it's posted on YouTube somewhere, I saw it once. I was like, oh my god, so meta. So, if you so have they a, actually filmed it. Yes, it's it's a special feature on a German special edition DVD with commentary by Stephen Barron, which doesn't make sense because I wish that was over here. Yeah. But it, but if you have a region free DVD or Blu-ray player, go on Amazon and buy it. Okay. Mm-hmm. As for the witches, what more can I say? It was a a terrific. Uh, nostalgic, scary film to look back on, and I might do so again in the future at some point. When's the Blu-ray release? <laughs> well, we're going to have to bug the Warner Archive for that one. They've been doing a really good track record so far. They had the Hudsucker, mm. Grace Stoke, Lord of the Apes, mm-hmm. Gypsy. Okay. All I right. All right, all right. Quickly. I'm a huge Turtle fan. I love the original first film. The second film is a guilty pleasure. I fucking love it. I grew up on it. I used to watch it a lot as a kid. Third Me one. Too. Third one. Third one. God. Let it out. Let it out. Why? Why three? Why three? But this ain't about Turtles. It's about our birth year, 1990. Yes, Turtles was a great comic book adaptation. One of the greatest comic book movies ever made. Uh, I was trying to think of the cartoon elements. Yeah, I kind of had a cheeky, fun laughter to it. I, I was trying to, I was thinking about the adaption of the cartoon with the characters from the cartoon, not from the comic book. Um, screwed me up, Morgan. You screwed me up with the two double feature. Oh my god. Um, three minutes left. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, oh, wait, is this, is this really the end of the podcast? Pretty damn close. <laughs> Oh, I wanted to bring up Gremlins too. I was about, to, yeah, I was about to, I was about to wonder more. It's like, it's just like, is Morgan gonna go with that? Yeah. You know what? I'm gonna do something special for this episode. There, I'm doing something special. We're gonna go around one more time as we planned out. Morgan, you can mention Gremlins too. So we're gonna come back around. And James can talk about the film that he was originally going to say, but we saved it for you, Morgan, especially. So, James, go with your film, and don't worry about the timer. I will fix the timer when it goes off. Okay. I was born in the summer, so was this film. Uh, Summer of 84, we're talking Ghostbusters. So... Yes, Morgan, I just, I, I saved this for you at, uh, at uh, the request of the rest of the gang here. Um, what, You're welcome. What, yes. Thank you. Uh, this is a case of a film where I, I would actually very much like to, to revisit at some point in the future because there's, there's mainly nostalgia points for it. Um, there's mainly nostalgia points. I mean, you have, uh, you have a story that, that somehow perfectly balances comedy, fantasy, and horror, and science fiction, all in, all in one swipe in it, and I realize, even going forward, uh, looking back, and looking back at the same time, 
Uh, just the amount of research that the that had gone into the film. You think you look at this and you think, okay, so it's just a fun, it's a fun blockbuster comedy with goo that had uh, uh, that had some of the best comedians at the time, and it was, I believe, uh, uh, it was, I believe, uh, an idea from Dan Aykroyd. Because his father was uh, a ghost specialist, and uh, uh, he was he himself was a, a ghost hunter, which uh, some some fans have jokingly referred to Dan Aykroyd as a second generation demon hunter by extension. <laughs> Make that into a uh, movie, please. Yes, second generation demon hunter. There's there's your title for a hit. Yep. Um, you know, the, Douglas Furs and all the shebang. <laughs> <laughs> ah yes, we'll have to t- we'll have to shoot this around around Twin Peaks. Yes. But, um, <laughs> well, considering the second season, it would work perfectly. Oh yeah, yeah. We could have just Dan Aykroyd running and going. Have you seen a ghost? Have you seen a ghost? And you could see Slimer going around the Northern Exposure Hotel, eating all the guests' food, <laughs> and then possessing the one-armed man. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> no, 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 no. He he possessed Leland, Leland Palmer. That explains why oh. he's dancing around in the lobby, <laughs> Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I did kill my daughter. I'm innocent. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. Uh, you can tell what we were watching last night, eh? No, you, but... you can tell. Um, Twin Peaks. Uh, here's here's an interesting bit of trivia, Morgan. I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but it says on the set Dan Aykroyd referred to the Slimer Ghost as the Ghost of John. The Ghost of John Belushi. Yeah, he, he knows all too well. If he was, uh, Slimer was, was also gonna... where he was. Mm-hmm. Slimer was also going to be called Onion Head, but unfortunately, a scene referring to that was deleted, so he was just known as Slimer. Unofficial. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, in the cartoon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, that that uh, joke could have come full circle if there was a scene in which uh, Slimer was eating hamburgers. Mm, hamburger, hamburger, hamburger! Pepsi, 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 Pepsi! Would you like a hamburger? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no! It was cheeseburgers. Cheese, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, oh, cheeseburger, 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 cheeseburger. Hey there, Stay Puff Marshmallow Man! Would you like a cheeseburger? No coke, no fries, chips. <laughs> If this movie was made in 2000, they could have referred to him that character as the ghost of Chris Farley. Ooh. 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 Uh, well, it's only funny when one comedian does it, but another comedian, there's a... Uh, fine line. Fine line, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, as you can tell, we especially love Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. We love it so much. We are going to dedicate an episode on it, so we're not gonna do a whole bunch of talk about it. I think this is the reason why we did this episode, anyways. I can't wait to wear my Ghostbusters suit. <laughs> oh, that's gonna be a fun episode, anyways. I watch Ghostbusters. I loved it as well, but in 1989, Ghostbusters 2 came out. Mm, and... 1989. I'm speaking in circles, so sorry about that. 1989 it was the year of my birth. Sorry about that. Ghostbusters 2 came out the same year, but I'm not going to talk about Ghostbusters 2, oddly enough. I'm going to talk about another franchise that had another sequel, which was Back to the Future Part 2. It's one of my favorite sequels. You can talk about number 3 if you want to. Yes, I was going to mention that 
Yes, both part two and part three were filmed back to back and released a year after each other. So technically, nineteen ninety, Back to the Future Part Three came out as well. So, oh. but part two in particular, uh, but part two, the, the, some changes happened. Some changes. Um, first off, uh, being the actress who played Marty's girlfriend, it was did not uh, come back. Claudia, Claudia Wells did not come back, so Elizabeth Shue was casted instead. She did a good job as the girlfriend. Who she looked the, the part. Uh, she seemed like a dumbed-downed version of the character. She didn't seem like the strong-hearted character <laughs> she was in the original, but I digress. Um, Back to the Future Part 2 at the prospect of predicting the future somehow in 2015, which is coming out next year, and none of the stuff that was predicted in that film is not coming true yet. Because um, a lot of people are really hoping stuff would happen, but, uh, you know... It's I just, wouldn't it's count a, on it. It's just a film. It's just a film, people. Move on. I mean... You still you, want that hoverboard. I mean, that hoverboard, man. I mean, there was that whole fiasco where... It, uh, wasn't there like a clip from a behind the scenes where Robert Zemeckis says all oh, the hoverboards are real, ha ha ha, and all the kids went crazy trying to call up trying to get a hoverboard? <laughs> yeah, but then no, but like, but then there's also the factor of uh, the shoes, you know the yes the the self lacing shoes, which which I heard that Nike is working on and they were hopefully trying to release it next year. Well, they are they they do have like. The Nick, they the, did release the, prototypes before. The, not, the, not, they, but they, they, they don't. They, they have the patent for it. They made a patent for it. No, um, but they released like prototypes, but they're not like automatic. They're just like shoes. They're yeah. They they're called Nike oh. Megs or something. They look exactly like the yeah. prop in the film. I really want a pair because I. But you know what? They probably won't fit my feet. Um. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's really clever how they kind of, like, predict how the future would be in 2015. With floating hover cars, you got hoverboards, you have the the look of Hill Valley, how it changed over the years, and... 3D it, Jaws. <laughs> yes, Jaws 19, which I doubt that they're going to make... Uh, what the hell is my math? The one thing it couldn't predict though was Sharknado. So, no. <laughs> oh yeah. God. Yeah. So I doubt. Well, technically, that is Jaws, Jaws 19. Was... That is their Jaws James, 19. James, you hit across something. It predicted mm. the popularity of shark movies. Yes. Oh. <sighs> oh my God. Yes, that's really what, clever. No, what if? What if, okay, technically it was Jaws 19, right? Yeah. What if in 2015 they would release, like, the 19th shark movie that's going to be crazy popular? I would love to see that. Oh, my God, that would be, oh, my God, yes. Well, it's going to, well, the only disappointing thing is that the shark will still not look real, though. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Indeed, yes. But... And also, the mind you, but back to Part part 2, they do a clever thing where they go back in time to the first movie and they interact with the past and it's like who comes up with this shit i mean i i I don't think it's never been done in a film to my knowledge at least i mean they have to go back to the 50s and they had to like kind of get the sets back up and reshoot things and it was it was just phenomenal what they did Back to Future Part 3, just... I like Westerns, mm. but... But I like Back to the Future Part 3. It wrapped the story up nicely, I, I, and there was a lot of fun things, and it had new challenges, I'm and... just it pulling was... your chain. I love Back to the Future Part 3, you moron. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I freaking love it, man. I love Westerns. I mean, it did tie up the story very well. Even though in the anime series, I brought the DeLorean back, and I don't know why they did it. That wasn't the cars that cool. was a train. Okay, yeah, and the train is... But yep, yeah, it was a good trilogy. It's a great trilogy. I mean, two would have to be 
up there with the original. I like the trilogy as a whole. I don't consider two to be my favorite out of the series. I like like to watch them a triple feature. It's a great mm-hmm. trilogy to check out. Yeah, two when I was while growing up was actually my favorite in the group for one particular reason. All the cool future stuff. I didn't care about going back to the past. I didn't care about going back to the old west. All I cared about was looking forward to the future in 2015. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. But I have to say, as an adult, you're 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 right. I don't think any for, for me at least. I don't really think any film is better or worse than than another one. Even though they do get. Even though the argument can be made that they do get repetitive by the end of the third film, you know you got some of the same, you got the, you got some of the same scenes. You know Marty gets knocked out, wakes up, and thinks whoever he's talking to is his mother, whether or not she is. True. Yeah, it does have its repetitive themes. Well, and, time, uh, well, well time does keep repeating itself. If you put it that way. I was just gonna say that you read my mind. <laughs> um. And then you had the uh, the train sh- the the train shot at the end of the third film is pretty much a, a copy paste of the of the shot of the flying car at the end of the first. At least I think the way that it the I way just, that it takes off. Oh, you mean yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking. I, about. I, I just saw it as the series coming full circle. Yeah. Yeah, different. Same shot, different vehicle. But um, uh, part two, uh, the predictions that they got right about the future of the return of coincidental, part- very coincidental, coincidental yeah. predictions, and uh, uh, the popularity of 3D movies, uh, the multiple streams of information coming in, uh, or uh, for example. Um, yeah, they got the one scene where Marty Jr.'s watching, like, all these different TV channels at the same time. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, the ability to video chat with people. Yes. Oh, Skype. yeah. Skype. Skype. Uh, which, which actually had been done before, but, you know. Yeah, to be fair, like, keep in mind, I mean, we also had the Jetsons, so. Yeah, yeah, it's like 20 too. years earlier, that so. too, yep. Oh, please, uh, please, please, please don't remind me of Jetsons the movie that came no, out. No, 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 the, the show. The series. The show. Oh, the sure. series in the 60s. Okay. Not, that, no, no, not the movie. Not that crap. Thank you. Calm down. Jesus. Calm down. And, of course, the Spruce greatest Spruce Pockets, man. What was that? And, of course, the greatest prediction of all, which came true, according to Christopher Lloyd, who introduced us to the hoverboard uh, earlier this year. And they had an entire video with uh, with Tony Hawk writing on the oh, hoverboard. Yeah. yeah, that hoax. But oh my God. actually, yeah, that, yes. you're you're kind of wrong. There it was really Leslie Nielsen. What? Back, Back to the Future Night, 1989. It's on the no, Dennis DVD. No, we're talking about that hoax video recently. Oh, the hoax. Oh, the hoax. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that video. Where that, the frick are you going? That, that kept, that kept us all hyped up for, it, and it, it just... It was a behind-the-scenes special night where they showed the first movie on NBC and a special bonus near the end where they showed some behind-the-scenes stuff in the sequel, and that's where the whole hoverboards are real thing came yeah, up. I've and seen it was that. Hosted by... was kind of cool. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing is, with, that, with this year's hoax video, I'm thinking, you know, I was watching it... And, and saying to myself, okay, okay, you know what? I'm not even going to fall for this. It it looks like a great special effect and whatnot. And for some reason, for some reason, people fell for it. Yes. Yeah, and, so for some reason, and for some reason, and for some reason, Christopher Lloyd decided to apologize afterward. And I'm like, uh, why? It was a prank video, wasn't it? I wasn't even sure what the hell it was to begin with. I mean, isn't it like supposed to be like some kind of college humor video or something? No, I I don't think it was. I thought it was just a. But the, yeah, but the point is that I d- dug the hell out of Back to the Future Part Two. It was 
some plus the fact different. plus the fact that I think it's yeah the hats are pretty much popular nowadays. Yeah. Well, like so, they're not a trend, but they sell like hotcakes at conventions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, Back to the Future nerds know what we're, what we're doing. There's even one thing you guys kind of overlooked about Back to the Future Part Two's future correction prediction. Talking mm. about Nost- nostalgia never dies. Yes. Um, Seriously. That, um... That that city is embellished in the 1980s. Everything about the yep. 80s yep. is celebrated, Kathy, even down Kathy to and then the, e- um, even even down to Max like Headroom, the, Michael Jackson. Yep, yep, yep. And then the, um, the antique pawn shop had a, a doll of um, Roger Rabbit, and then all the nostalgia. And then the Jaws Betamax tape. <laughs> so all the hints of nostalgia and the laser discs in the trash. Mm-hmm. Next to the silicone breast stuffings. <laughs> and, uh... I am not making this up. I am not making this up. Watch that scene again where they put his girlfriend on these bins, whatever. You see laser discs and the silicone they use on <laughs> breast implants. I'm not even kidding. Uh, first result. Um, bonus round. Hey. Um, Is it time for the lightning round? It's the lightning round. It's the lightning round. So, um, went through James and James, mine, and Morgan's. Now we gotta go with the last one with Matt. Oh, my last? Okay. Yes, you round it off. Okay, so... And you're mentioned too, Morgan, yeah. Okay, so, in 1992, we also, there was also another... Um, for all the other animated films during that time... Uh, this is when uh, they were starting to copy Disney. Essentially, they noticed that Disney has this formula going on that really makes it successful. One of which that they try to copy, uh, one of the studios, or at least one movie that tries to copy this Disney formula. I know what you're mo- talking about. It's a movie in which I actually recently reviewed Fengali. Oh, <laughs> The last really? dream. I, I thought what it was the you? Swan Princess. Was the Swan Princess oh. released? Uh, wait a minute. Oh, oh! I thought you were going to talk about Tom and Jerry the movie. Oh, dang. No! No! <laughs> <laughs> yes! The Swan Princess no. did go in 1994. Oh, no, it was 1994. Okay, Mar- Mike, what, Mike, are you are you thinking that I was going to talk about Baby's Kids? No. But yes, you're right. You're right. During that time, that that's like there's a lot of these films. Swan Princess, I don't think it was even no, released in that year. Yeah, it was 94. 94. No, but it was yeah, yeah, that, it was the year in which all the animated films that they're starting to copy it. Tom and Jerry the movie, um, Bebe's Kids, Rockadoodle. Freaking, oh god, Cool World was that year. <laughs> Jesus. But anyways, with Fern Gully, I do understand why people say it's a bad film. They, I do get why... They say it's stupid, you know. It's it's really, it really really hammers down the environmental message to the point where even I'm blown by this. Is that it? The movie literally ends off with "for our children and our children's children." That I find just insane that a movie finishes. However, I will say this: because it's so stupid, because it's so cheesy. Because it rips off di- like the Disney formula and stuff like that, I actually like it. I think it's pretty. I think like in the right mindset, it really is enjoyable. There are still some good benefits though. The animation. I don't think there's any denying that it's fantastic. They really did a great job uh, with Fern Gully. They really made uh, the for uh, the the jungle look really nice. The characters are designed very well. Um, great animation and all that stuff. And there's also some of the side characters, um, some of which is mostly coming from the charm of the actors. Once again, we have Robin Williams doing the same thing, not um, not not as good as Aladdin, but still he has a lot. He actually has a lot of funny moments and even a lot of great quotable moments. Awesome use of language, dude. Um, the name and is then... Betty. The logic is erratic. <laughs> God, have you ever have you ever listened? To the, to the on soundtrack movies, version. Uh, Holy movies. crap! That was so demented. The, we need another animal here. We need another animal here. Oh my God. Okay, 
I I was editing the review of Fern Gully. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll unpick Batty. It was like I was expecting the whole thing to be just the rap, and then I was like, I was just listening. It's like, it's like at suddenly at one point it just stops, and it suddenly goes to this like little rockabye baby too. It's like, dee, dee, dee. and all we hear is like, we need another animal. Stop it, Lux. Give me another animal. I was like, sweet Jesus, what is this? Okay, I'm not picking that. Then tell me, what happened when you got to Toxic Love? <laughs> toxic Love? It's Tim At that point, it turned into Villa Day. I feel good. A new kind of horny. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's Tim, Tim Curry. Curry trying to... That, that's... Do I need to explain more? It's Tim Curry. I am going... I am going to pillage and grind all creatures great and small. I am going Tim to Curry. pillage and... I don't care. That movie's really... <laughs> How did I make it the soundtrack? It's Tim Curry, damn it. I know, it's just... Mm. <laughs> it's another film yeah, I grew it's... up on. Another childhood favorite. No, but definitely. I think... No, but, like, technically... Uh, also, one thing I want to mention is regarding the environmental message. I know that I said that it really does hammer down, but I think it really works. Mm -hmm. Unlike recent animated films nowadays like Rio 2 or Cloudy 2, where they suddenly throw the environmental message at the last minute, it feels like the movie really doesn't care. It just puts on that as like some sort of default because it's a kids movie and they need to put in like some kind of a, like a, a good message as a kids movie. They just don't even give a single crap. With Fern Gully, as hammered down, as cheesy as it makes it, at least you can feel like it's it's trying to be serious with its message. At least you know it cares about the environment. You know it wants to, like you know it wants people to learn about this tree, the importance of trees, and to save them and all that stuff. It sounds crazy, I know, but you can really feel like this movie is serious about its message. It really wants to say it, and that and honestly, after going through films like. Rio 2, Lorax, Cloudy 2, and stuff like that. I, re I really do have an appreciation for Fern Gully. It's stupid, it's cheesy, yes, but it's good. Yeah, it's what. Yeah, you gotta love the cheesy films once in a while. Yeah. Although I will say there are some moments where it's way where it's like it's way too cheesy even for me. Like I honestly hate Lord of the Thousand Dances. You know. Na 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 Dan Aykroyd dances in the great outdoors. It's no, no, no. Infernally is just too much. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about Infernally. It's like too much. It's like it's, it's like it's breaking the radar in cheesiness. It's like okay, stop, yep. stop it, <laughs> stop it. It's like, <laughs> and of course, need we not forget Tone Lock? Yes, as the um, freaking. Oh, Yes. Mm -hmm. If I'm gonna I, I, somebody, might that, as well be you. That was the time where he had his acting that, career. That scene alone was the main reason I didn't watch that movie for a long time. It scared me. <gasps> Lizard comes out with a deep voice singing about eating somebody. Done! Do you know, do you know there's an actual fetish that, uh, that, um... Love scenes like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't. It's not, it's Wait, not there's actually tone, what? You mean there's a tone lock lizard fetish? No, there's a fetish where people like being. I. To, I just like to have... be tone lock tone lock lizards. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> I, it's, 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 a, it's a touchy territory. Have, okay. It's a touchy I actually territory. Just, <laughs> okay, now you gave me this really nasty. It this is a nasty it, thought it's, of mine. It's a nasty fetish. Where yeah. the tone uh, lock lizard is singing that as he approaches a woman's legs. If I'm gonna eat somebody, so, might as well. We, okay, we need to get out of this hole. We need to get us out of this hole. Like, yeah, yeah, I know what it's called, Morgan. That's, that, that's what it's called. If you want to look it up, it's, it's, just, a, it's, it's, a, it's just, a weird fetish, all right? Let's move it, on. Let's it's not, it's just, no, 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 no. I just want to say, it's just that as a kid, I got freaked out by deep voices. As I was scared of the snuffle up, I guess, for a long time. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm coming you f for you in your sleep, bird. <laughs> Took me a long time to accept him. Anyways. 
It's actually a good tie-in he did there with Matt with Robin Williams. Uh-huh. Um, so, Morgan, you can have your extra mention. You get an extra yeah. mention on your list. Let me just say, in terms of sequels, this one is just nuts. Um, Gremlins 2, the new batch, is actually one I saw before Gremlins, which is weird because as a kid I always saw sequels first before the original, the only exception being Indiana Jones and Star Wars. Um, But when you really think about it, Gremlins 2 was really in a huge pit of blockbusters at that point. It was up against Arachnophobia, Dick Tracy, uh, put up a little cheat sheet here just for quick quick bits um it was up against exorcist 3 ducktales the movie problem child being another one mm-hmm. jetson's the movie like it, has, man, it doesn't sound like it has much competition well unless you have another 48 hours in total recall and frank and hooker and mm-hmm. the fact that this movie was released the same day as dick tracy came out mm-hmm. oh dear okay now it has 30 seconds no more dick <laughs> dumb dick Anyway, Gremlins 2, um, you know, in production, Warner Brothers tried to make this sequel without Joe Dante's involvement, and even at one point they're going to have the Gremlins on Mars, which would have been dumb. But um, thankfully they turned around and said, hey, you can do whatever you want, and they said, well, you know what, let's just take a look at the things that are popular in the 1990s. Genetic Engineering and Frozen Yogurt, and that was their movie. You have the creatures spawning in this larvish... Um, building that's sort of like the cornucopia of the future. You have cable television, you have all these departments and stuff like that, and it opens for a lot of opportunities for the Gremlins to go in and just destroy it, and you just are in ultimate joy over it. I just realized something. We should have brought this this movie up when it came to Die Hard knockoffs. <gasps> oh. 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 oh! That's so true! Oh. Oh my god! How do we miss that? There's only wow. a few little heroes that can that can save everybody. James, this this is this is Gremlins. We can let it slide. Oh, uh, I guess so. We would have brought it up by then. Oh my god! And, and, and the first one itself was wacky, but it was grounded. This one is like all over the place. The fact that the Gremlins can do anything. They're living cartoons that just like to kill, destroy humanity, and make a mockery of it at the same time. That's what makes you know this one work so well, is that it's just literally off the cuff. But not to the point where it's just too much. Even the point where it just parries itself. Like the scene where Lennon Malton does a review of Gremlins 1, and he gets killed by the Gremlins. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. He's like, no oh, wait, guys, we're really kidding. But, uh, who would who would want to release a special edition about a movie that that features little monsters killing people? Blah on blah, blah 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 blah. <laughs> Uh, and then you have the fact that it does the most larvish thing of all. Joe Dante is the man at B movie homages. Um, Midway, the film breaks, and they make it look as if the Gremlins invaded the theater, and they have Hulk Hogan trying to stop the whole situation. It was an homage to The Tingler, where they had this little centipede creature. It's a 1950s movie with Vincent Price. Good good film, by the way, directed by William Castle. Um, there's a sequence midway in The Tingler where The Tingler gets loose in the theater, and what they did was they had these buzzers under the seats – and they went off to make it like the Tinger was in the theater, so they had people jumping up and screaming. Um, for Gremlins 2, they wanted that same effect, but with the Gremlins in the theater and the studio was going to cut that. But then Joe Dante did a preview, and the audience had a really good time, so they kept it in. And then home video came along, and they said, we can't have that. Let's have John Wayne come in and try to save the tape from being eaten. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they were changing the channel constantly, and they invade a Western. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, John Wayne died, so they had to get an impersonator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, what was I? What was I going to say? The uh, the idea of the Tingler, uh, Joe Dante later used that for another film. Matinee. Matinee. A mm-hmm. tribute to William Castle. It's funny, too, because when um, they did a very, very rough cut of this film, if I remember correctly, they did it for Steven Spielberg, and at the end, they turned in and said, well, what'd you think? And Spielberg said, there's too many gremlins in this movie. <laughs> and 
the film itself originally ran, I think, for like two hours and seven minutes tops. And sadly, they removed, I think, a good bulk of footage, which you can see on the DVD. Um, most infamous, infamously a scene where you see um, Bob Clampett, you know, Bob Clamp looking over these TV monitors, and he sees a black and white version of It's a Wonderful Life, and he's so distraught over it that he just slowly goes over and he pushes a button that poorly colorizes and he smiles in the light. <laughs> Um, there's even more Gremlins Rampage, including a weird, weird scene where the brain Gremlin is singing New York, New York to an out-of-tune New York band, and the Daffy Gremlin is having too much fun with the cymbals, and he tries to attack the trombonist. <laughs> so, um, if you have the chance, I highly recommend checking this one out if you really want to leave your brain at the door. The bonus features are even worth it. They got, like, a very nice audio commentary with the cast and crew together, um... Oh no, it's mostly Joe Dante and Michael Finn, but uh, Finnell. But still, um, it's a blast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's yes. a shame. It's a shame it didn't do well, but yeah. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? It's a damn fine sequel. Check it out. Uh, with that, we are going to end this podcast because. He talked pretty much a good chunk of what we experienced in our birth years. Um, so in the comments below, would you please tell us what your films of your birth year is and why you like them so much? Uh, actually, the time is going to run out pretty soon. I'm just going to wrap it up here. Um, I'm Mike Mixtape, and this has been Cinema Royale, and we're going to get into Cinema Password pretty soon. Hmm. Yeah. You guys can uh, sign off. Um. Oh. Oh. Ciao for now. Oh, see you later, dudes. I'm Morgan Ledger, and I have a Patreon account now. Yay! Here so we go. do I. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna get us! He must pull us! He must pull us on the Patreon! It's not Snowflake! It's not Snowflake! It's still fake! It's still fake! It's still fake. <sighs> and those for you who are still watching this, uh, the Sima Password game is about to begin. James has no freaking clue what this topic of epic portion for the next episode is. I don't know what it is. I don't think I remember either. No, I don't know what it is either. Privately message us, Mike. All right, just give me a sec. Do 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 do. Oh, oh, sorry, can't you? You can't see it at home. Nope, nope, nope. You can't see it at home. You cheaters. Hey, hey, hey! Don't look! Don't look! Don't look! This is magic hour, folks. <laughs> don't worry, I'm holding my hand in front of the monitor. Like it's gonna oh. do any good. Huh? Give me a sec. Oh. Give, 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 no, give me a sec for more. Oh. Do, 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 do. Waiting. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> did, did I refresh your memory? Mm hmm. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Alright, bring it. Um, so, I kind of hinted. A bit in the episode of what the next episode's gonna be, especially with the film I talked about and the alarm you heard. Shark movies? Shark movies. movies. Shark, Shark movies! Shark movies. Oh my god. Two weeks from now, it's gonna be Discovery Channel's Shark Week, and it's a good time to talk about shark movies in honor of Shark Week. Are they are they premiering Sharknado two yet? That's gonna be in two days on July thirtieth. Boom! Sharknado two, the second one, which I'm so who's gonna watching. talk about? So who who would dare talk about it? Back for seconds. <sighs> actually, I got to be down. I got the original movie. Shark oh, man. I'm gonna wear a Hawaiian shirt and grab a bar stool for that one. Alrighty then.
All right, guys, prepare you prepare your dolly zooms. Don't get eaten by sharks. Actually, oddly enough, I just read this fact today. Uh, people get killed by coconut fallings than shark attacks. More and remember, fuel. And remember, folks. Technically, water can be set on fire. <laughs> See you in two weeks, guys. Ciao for now. See you later, dudes. We're gonna need a bigger boat. Oh, and by the way, Morgan, one more thing. Hold on. Here. Have a fluffy cow. <laughs> what? <laughs> the dead thing's off. Morgan has a fluffy cow. <laughs> it's so fluffy, I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it's the only thing you could say to that cow! <laughs> I never saw a fluffy cow until I did. Welcome to Wisconsin's answer to the state fair. You pamper the cow, you wash it up, and show him off. Alright. <laughs> Get the electrical groomer. Poof. I think we ended off on a good note. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I forgot to mention, James. 1984 was the same year. That James Cameron directed The Terminator, and Joe Dude. Dante directed Gremlins, and those two mm. directors directed Piranha and Piranha 2 previously. You also forgot that in 1989, Howie Mandel did Little Monsters. You are not... <laughs> that came... It came out on August 25th! I am not... Explain to Morgan. See you in two weeks. Yeah. Putzes. Hey. Oh, oh, uh, the end.